you really do reap what you sow. Amen. Good and bad. You'd be surprised we're going to talk a lot about the good tonight as well as the bad. Why don't you go to Matthew, the 25th chapter, if you will, please. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Let's begin reading at the 14th verse. Very familiar. Verse 14, very familiar. Kingdom of heaven, says a man traveling into a far country. He called his servants and delivered unto them his goods. To one he gave five talents, to another two, another one. To every man according to his several ability, he straightway took his journey. When he received, he had received the five talents, went and traded the same, made them another five talents. Likewise also, he that received two, he gained another two. The one who received the one, of course, remember what he did, he digged into the earth, he had his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord, those servants come, cometh and reckoneth with them. He that received five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five. Behold, I have gained beside five more. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful of a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter in the joy of the Lord. He that received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two. I've gained two more. The Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. He that received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee, thou art a hard man. Reaping where you have not sown, together without straw. I was afraid, I hid it in the earth. There thou hast that is thine. The Lord said unto him, You wicked, slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I sow not, together where I have not strawed. You should have, therefore, have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I would have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him, said ten. And of course, he was cast into outer darkness. Very familiar scripture that has to do with reaping and sowing. Heavenly Father, thank you tonight for Jesus. Holy Spirit, I need to be quickened. Holy Ghost, come and quicken my body. Let me speak as the oracle of God tonight. Lord, don't let anybody stay in this service tonight without being moved by the Holy Ghost, changed by the word of the Lord. Quicken us, Lord. Sanctify me. I take your authority, Jesus, over every demon power, every prince upon him, power of darkness, that nothing in this house can disturb or or uh, hinder the word of the Lord from going forth, quickened by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this matter of sowing and reaping, you know, goes two ways. It's both good and bad. You know, all, all my life and all your life, you, Christian life, you've heard this. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, that has a bad connotation, but it also has a good connotation. In fact, probably most of my message tonight will deal with the good connotation. The Bible said, in due season, you shall reap if you faint not. Now, there is a sowing to the flesh. There's a sowing to the flesh that brings a terrible, awful harvest. How many people do you know that sowed to the flesh? And you know, you look at their life and they are reaping on all sides. Have you ever seen a day where there's been such awful reaping, such terrible reaping for sins that have been sown, uh, physical problems, mental problems, family problems on all sides, people who have been sowing to the flesh and sowing to the flesh, and now they are reaping what they have sown. It's an awful harvest. You can see the effects of the sowing to the flesh here in the United States. Let, let's talk about what America's reaping now. Let's talk about the nation first, not just individuals, but corporately as, as a nation. Look what we are sowing, for example, in our public schools. You know, all through New York now, uh, the schools are in absolute chaos. We have teachers that are afraid to go into the classroom anymore. Let, let me remind you that in 1940, that's just one generation, in 1940, all classes opened with prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. They would pray first and then pledge allegiance to the American flag. But there was prayer every morning in school. That was one generation ago. God's blessing was asked upon the school. They prayed for the principal. They prayed for their teachers. And over the PA system, there was public prayer. School was opened with public prayer. And they said, one nation under God. 
And folks, he honored that. He honored our classrooms. This nation was number one in education. I don't even know where it is now. Many nations have passed us. Many of our kids can't even read or write anymore. In 1940, just a generation ago, the top seven disciplinary problems in our schools were as follows. The number one problem in school in 1940s, right up to 1950, number one problem was talking in class. Number two was chewing gum. Number three was making noises. Number four, running in the halls. Number five, cutting in line. Number six, improper clothing. Number seven, not taking out the garbage. Not disposing of the garbage properly. Leaving apples on the desk, for example. Now, today, the most recent survey, let me give you the top seven disciplinary problems in our American schools today. Since we took God out, we took prayer out, we took the Bible out, we want nothing to do with God, we chased Him out, we want nothing that resembles God in our schools. Now, when I say we, we're talking about the liberal mind, we're talking about the godless people who have pushed this upon our society. The number one problem in our schools today, rape. Number two, and this, this is documented, <clears throat> robbery. Number three, assault. Number four, burglary. Number five, arson. Number six, bombing. Number seven, murder. That's one generation, folks. We are reaping. All of these are related to drug abuse. Every one of these problems have to do with young people that are on drugs. I don't know if you know that in Brook, up in the Bronx, in one of the schools just recently, a seven-year-old boy in first grade came and laid on his desk a whole bag of marijuana. And he was going to pass it out to his classmates. Seven years old in first grade with a bag of marijuana. I don't even know where he got it. I don't know the whole story. But it all has to do with drug-related problems. Well, we wanted God out. We let the devil in. It's payday. We are reaping in America in our schools what has been sowed to the flesh. They're calling now uh, for free condom uh, distribution in our schools, even to 7th and 8th graders. And now, you know what the latest, latest thing is now? Condom vending machines in all of our schools. Supposedly to protect our young people from AIDS. But you know what that's saying to our young people? We condone your sex. We know you're going to do it, so just protect yourself. What an awful, awful harvest that we are paying right now. One half of all the births in our city now are illegitimate. 50% of all the babies born to our young ladies now are illegitimate. One half of all the children born. The script, according to the latest report, one-fourth of all pregnancies are now being aborted. Every one-fourth of all pregnancies are ending in abortion. And 22 million abortions already, and some believe it may be 25 million abortions, and many of them just girls going without their parents even knowing it. In just one generation, we've come from chewing gum to machine guns. Now, are you understanding how far we've gone and what kind of thing we have? In a Bronx school, a student brought a Uzi machine gun to class hidden under his jacket, loaded. There's reports of teachers now all over New York and in all of our schools, even in country schools now, have saying there's no uh, respect for authority. They curse the teachers. I don't know if you heard now that uh, uh, this past week, two days ago, I think it was, uh, the Pope was in, in uh, Germany, in East Berlin, and hundreds of young people were cursing. They were stripping off their clothes, and they were throwing paint bombs at his Pope mobile. First time, any kind of reception like that, young people, wild and absolutely, uh, and, and these were young people who were admirers of Hitler. Right out of school, out onto the streets, no respect for any authority. Then, of course, we they called uh, 20 years ago, well, almost 30 years ago, for a sex revolution in the United States. The liberal press... And, and backslidden theologians called for a new day of sexual freedom. They said, we don't want any more of your Puritan moral standards. They said, anything goes between two mutually consenting adults. Anything goes if you're adult and you consent, anything goes. 
And so now we have homosexuals that have come out of the closet, who were in the closet for many, many hundreds of years now, out of the closet, on the streets, parading, and now moving into the schools to teach their lifestyle, and then taking to the streets, and now it's become in-your-face perversion. In your face, like it or not. They'll parade down the street with signs, we'll get your kids, like it or not. Some harvest we've paid. Some payday. Now it's payday with AIDS. Oh, God help us. The new disease is now 4 million cases of chlamydia. Chlamydia shuts the womb. And it looks to me like God's going to have to shut one womb for every abortion with chlamydia. There, there's, there's a new papillion now, a new cancer, uh, a sexual cancer that is horrible. There are things that we just can't even understand. So far beyond our comprehension. Payday. Syphilis is returning now to the, to, to, to the uh, sexual generation. This uh, revolution, sex revolution, has brought back syphilis. I have a Christian doctor who's on our board. He was here last Sunday sitting on the platform. And Dr. Rice said, Pastor Dave, he said, just 15 years ago, I had to give 600,000 units of penicillin, 600,000 units for syphilis. He said, today, I have to give 4,800,000 units, and it still doesn't kill this virus. Think of it, 4,800,000 units, and it doesn't touch it because it's, it, it, it's uh, uh, becoming absolutely uh, immune. To penicillin. And now with his uh, papilloma, it's called, virus. That's attacking many young women especially. And there's no end in sight. Almost every time you pick up the paper anymore, there's some new disease. Sexually transmitted disease. Folks, it's payday. We are reaping what we have sown to the flesh in our society. Now, what does this word mean? You reap what you sow. <clears throat> Folks, the... The Lord means that. The Bible means that. Look what we are reaping with our children now when we allow child pornography. It is allowed. Child pornography is allowed. It's, it, it, it's rife all over the United States now. And now, listen to me, folks. In the past 10 years, one of the number one problems in our society is incest. And primarily, parents molesting their own children. Now, we don't like to hear these things, but folks, that is the, what has happened to our society. It's payday. You can't keep feeding this garbage into the minds of the American society without reaping in it. What we, what we are reaping right now. We've become such a degenerate nation of, of some parents that are like wild animals and they're like beasts. Folks, I can't imagine a father or a mother raping their own child. It's a, that has to be a beast. Where does that come from? We are reaping what we have sown in what we call sexual freedom. And now, folks, we're about to reap another kind of harvest, and that's an economic crash because we have become a greedy nation. Wall Street right here is the, the, the bed, the hotbed of all of this greed. Everybody trying to get their hands on it. one big glass killing and what's happened folks l let me let me I quote you something I just read in a newspaper by uh, the Federal Reserve officer he said don't worry about multi-billion takeovers now with their 10 to 1 debt load he said there's too many other unknown forces out there now folks out there has become a term Every politician understands it. Every economist understands out there is a whole unknown thing about society, about our economy. Nobody even knows where it's going. Nobody can explain what's happening. One day, and I've been warning about it for a long time now, one day, overnight, and I've told you the vision I've had repeated at least five times. I've seen, I don't know who the president is, I just see his chair, he's turned, his seat toward the window and he's got all of his cabinet and all of his counselors in the room and he turns and he says how did it happen and every man in the room has his head down and everybody's shaking his head nobody in the room can explain what happened 
And the president is saying, what happened? How did it happen? Folks, it's going to happen and nobody going to be able to explain it because it's payday. We have been reaping greed uh, or sowing greed and we're going to reap a harvest. God, God has warned us and he's given us many, many opportunities to repent. But there's been no repenting. The Bible makes it very, very clear that we are going to suffer economically. <clears throat> there's a good side to this now. That's the bad side that I've just given to you. I hope you're ready for the good side. The Bible said, you reap what you sow. But he said, if you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap a wonderful harvest. Hallelujah. Uh, th th this whole story in, in uh, Matthew, the story that we just read to you, we went through it. I want to show you that the Lord is going to have a great host of willing sowers in the last days. How many believe that? God is going to have a whole host. He's going to have an army of people that are going to go out and sow the good seed. And before Jesus comes, there's going to be a great harvest. There's going to be a great harvest before Jesus comes. Now, this parable proves to me that God is going to have in the last day those who are bearing fruit. Now, often we focus on this one servant who goes out and he wraps his his uh, talent in a napkin. He wraps it all up and buries it. And many people think the church is going to be like that, that the, there's going to be so much sin, there's going to be so much wickedness, and all these things we talked about, the church is going to be downcast, Christians are going to be defeated, and they're just going to take their talent and bury it out of fear. This man said he's afraid, and he, he buried his talent. And people have the concept that the church of Jesus Christ is going to be so inundated with all kinds of problems that the cities are going to become so wicked and so violent. That is true. But this parable, if you see it in the spirit, is saying, no, that, there, that the majority in God's house, in the remnant, the holy remnant, are going to be bearing great fruit. They're going to be coming with their arms full. They're going to be joyful. They're going to serve the Lord with gladness. The Bible said these men said, I have gained, I have gained. There's going to be gain. Hallelujah. The closer we get to the coming of the Lord, the more fruitful Times Square Church ought to be. And I believe will be as the days come. Uh, you know, the Lord is not affected. The kingdom of God is not affected by the economy. The kingdom of God is not affected by anything the devil does. The devil can do everything he wants to. He can do all the demons of hell out. He can come down with great wrath. But that does not hinder in one iota the plan of God. God's plan is not going to be affected by it. Hallelujah. I was looking at this this afternoon in preparing for the service tonight. Our, our Lord is the one who's, the Bible says, who's traveling to a far country. And after a long time, he's going to return. And the talent here represents the measure of grace and revelation of Jesus Christ. Some One man was given a great revelation of Jesus. He was given five talents. Another was given two talents. Not, not as much revelation, but it was the true revelation of the grace of God. And the other was given a measure of the grace and revelation of Jesus. He buries his. But what happens... God says in the last days, he's trying to tell us that in the last days, he's going to have a people who trust him. He's going to have a people who are joyful in him. They know that he's not a hard taskmaster. If you think our God's a hard taskmaster, you're serving the wrong God. You have the wrong image. And that's why you bury your talent. That's why you have such a poor revelation of who Jesus is. Because you have a perverted view. You have never seen his grace and his mercy and his love for a lost humanity. Folks, I'm telling you, God is, God is absolutely, totally committed to saving a people. Do you understand he's committed to saving and keeping you from the power of the devil? He's committed to bringing you to his throne room. He's committed to presenting to you to the Father without blame, blameless before the Father. He's committed himself to that. 
He's committed himself that there is going to be a harvest in the last days. Hallelujah. So you can look at what the homosexual uh, uh, community is doing and, and, and say that doesn't concern the kingdom of God and his program. You can look at what is happening to our schools and you can grieve over it. You can pray about it, but that's not going to hinder the program of God. And, and I was, I've been very concerned about our young generation. We pray for our teenagers and that, but I'm going to show you in just a minute what God prophesied is going to happen. He, he, he's not going to let this generation be lost. There are going to be thousands and thousands of Christian young people in the last day coming to the Lord. Let me ask you, do you believe that the last day just before Jesus comes, there's going to be uh, a clearer and clearer vision of who Jesus is? Do you really believe what the scripture says that uh, though hell rages, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. That's the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. The kingdom of God is not affected by demons or by the economy, by communism, by violence or any world conditions. Hallelujah. This parable proves that God will have a last day army. Amen. I said a last day army prepared. I want to show you a prophecy. Now, before I turn there, remember, Jesus quoted this prophecy. Paul quoted it, and it's quoted seven times in the New Testament. So clearly, this is a last day prophecy of conditions in the church just before Jesus comes. Now, if this is good news. Go to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. I'm going to show you a prophecy about our young people. If you're a teenager tonight, oh, ask God to let this lay hold of you tonight. In fact, if you're under 25, I'd say that's young. At my age, anything is young. Martin Luther said of this uh, chapter, a glorious prophecy concerning the kingdom of Christ. It ought to be one of the nearest, dearest scriptures to everyone in the church. One of the dearest, most precious chapters of prophecy in the Bible. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. What's God, God going to do with the enemies of Jesus? They're going to be under his feet. That's the prophecy. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Who is the rod of his strength? That's Jesus. Hallelujah. In the midst of thine enemies. To rule. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now let me show you what this means. Follow me if you will please. Amen. There's a day of his power. Look this way, please. The Bible says there's going to be a day of his power. Now, we know there's been a day of his power ever since Jesus arrived, ever since he was on this earth and ascended the Father. It's been the day of his power. He's shown his power for the last 2,000 years. But remember how God showed his power in, Israel, in Egypt? First of all, he, he, he shook the earth, and then he literally shook the heavens with thunder and with darkness, and he kept increasing the day of his power and increasing it. And what did he do? A final rage of death to the firstborn. There was a burst of power. And do you know what the Lord said he's going to do? He's been shaking everything. But he said there's going to be one last shaking. He said, I'm going to shake everything. There's going to be a day of his power. And we're living in that day of his power. And he said, and in the day of his power, when God comes down to start dealing with his enemies. And folks, he is dealing with his enemies now. Oh, yes. Even presidents in the United States, they can hide and hide. It, but if, 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 if God says it's time, he exposes it. That was Watergate, for example. And, and, and no matter who's in Washington, you can't hide from God. You can't hide. I don't care who it is, Republican, Democrat. You can't hide from God. God God's going to have his way. 
You're, you, some of you are too, too young to remember Khrushchev. He came to the United Nations here and, and sat there and took off his shoes and banged it and said, we're going to bury you. Well, he's, he's, he's in a grave and he's dust now. All of these world leaders, these, these, these dictators, God just snaps his finger, blows on dust. He said that the nation of the world, a drop of dust in a bucket. He has all power and all authority. And folks, we're living the day of his power. When the Holy Ghost came, that was the day of his power. And he's increasing his power because he's about to come. And he said, in that time, my people are going to be willing. Hallelujah. He said, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised yet once more, I'll shake not on the earth, but the heaven. My people shall be willing. Hallelujah. Now, the scripture says, it's, this people, this prophecy says that they're going to see the beauty of holiness. Now, folks, you've got to stop here and listen to me, because God really spoke this to my heart. There, there are going to be people in the last time that don't feel that holiness is a burden. That, that you know, this reproof and all of this, oh, no, I can't live like that. God says there are going to be a people so willing and have such a heart for him that holiness is going to become a beauty to them. It's going to be a joy, a wonderful experience. And, and they're going to thank God for reproof that provokes them to righteousness. Because they're going to say, uh, and, and really from their heart they see these are beautiful words because it produces a beautiful effect in my life. It's producing righteousness. My people, he said, I'm going to come in power. And it's going to be my day of power. And in my day of power... I'm going to have a people. God's not going to send angels down to do his work. He's got us to do it. And he said, I'm going to make you willing. Not only going to make you willing to go out and sow the revelation I gave you of my heart and of my son. You're going to, folks, we're going to have people going around who know Jesus in such an intimate, personal way that everywhere they go, that's the witness. They're going to say, I know you know Jesus. They can see it on your countenance. Everything about you is the revelation of Jesus. You're not going out with four little scriptures. You're not going out with some little thing that you have learned to quote. You're not just mouthing scriptures. You are a living testimony of who Jesus is. And the, the Bible says you're going to have such a beauty about you. It's going to be the beauty of holiness that you fully accept you know, we've got preachers in the pulpit screaming, we don't live by law anymore. The law is dead. It's gone. It's all grace. Yes, it is grace. But he said, I'll put the law in your hearts. You will love to serve me. You will love to fulfill my law because I'm going to get the power to do it. Hallelujah. Folks, that, that, that's a wonderful church when people are serving the Lord just because they love him. Because there's a beauty in just walking with him. Hallelujah. That helps make you willing to obey him. Now, it says in verse 3, Thou hast the dew of thy youth. Now, folks, I'm not the only one that saw this. I was surprised that uh, Jonathan Edwards, Calvin, Rogers, and some of the great uh, prophets of God and writers from way back for the last 300 years, I, I, I thought I had some new revelation. You know, when you go out, in the morning, and you see the dew on the grass. Now, you'd have to go to Central Park in New York to see that. <laughs> Anybody been in Central Park when the dew comes? Folks, I was raised in the country. And when you go out in the early morning and you look at the dew, it's like millions and millions of diamonds, those little drops of dew. And he says, God says, I'm going to have the dew of youth. I'm going to have a whole sea of diamonds. I'm going to have the youth. And that's before he comes. It's going to be too late after he comes. This prophecy is being fulfilled in these our very days. They're going to be fulfilled, and I believe it with all my heart. God is going to have the dew of the youth. These are his diamonds. And that's exactly, exactly. It, it, and here's the meaning. These are young converts, servants of the Lord, they shall be like beads, as numerous as drops of the morning dew. That's the meaning. As numerous as the drops of the morning dew. 
Folks, you don't go out in, in a morning in the field when the dew comes and just see a drop here and a drop there. The fields are covered with these diamonds. They sparkle in the sun. When the sun comes, they just sparkle. Has anybody seen that? Is, am I the only? Okay. All right. I thought I was the only one who saw that. Hallelujah. There is absolutely nothing in heaven or earth that's going to stop this last day harvest. Now, there's, there's something unique and special about these last day servants. This, this, these, these young people, especially, that God is calling and these willing people, they're not going to be afraid to plow in the cold. Your scripture says the sluggard, that's the lazy Christian, he will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. You know who these people are? They're not going to have anything. It's harvest time. And the Bible says there's going to be some. There are going to be churches just dead. There are going to be churches in this city while we are packed and our alders are filled and people getting saved. Your families and all over. The dew is falling everywhere and the diamonds are shining. And God's people are willing in a day of power. There are going to be people saying, oh, it's too cold out there. You know, the, the, the demon powers are out there. The, 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 the rapists and, and uh, uh, people don't want God. You know, when I came to New York City and talked to some pastors about my vision of coming here into Times Square Church, they said, they don't want God here. I've been here 15, 20 years, nothing happens. You can't have any church Sunday night. It's too cold, you know. People are not going to come out. People are not going to, the, the, the subways are so dangerous. The city's getting so wild. They're not going to come to it. They might come Sunday morning and that's it. Everywhere I got, you can't do it. Can't do it. It's too cold. Too cold. I don't mean, you know, the weather, but I'm, that, that, that's what it means. It's too hard. It's too difficult. It can't happen. I got so sick and tired of that. I got so sick and tired of that everywhere I went. If I listened to what I heard from my minister friends, God bless them. I'd have never come to New York. They about tried to scare me to death. One pastor hadn't seen a soul saved in 10 years. At least that's the impression I got. Death everywhere. It's too cold to plow. God says, you go out in the cold and you plow. Doesn't matter what the weather is. Doesn't matter what people say. You go and plow and you sow your seed. I'm going to give you a harvest. Hallelujah. They said, oh, you, when I first came here, drug, drug addicts can't be chained. Nobody can. Drug addicts. When I first came to New York, there were, there were no ministries on drugs. In the United States, we were one of the first to, to prove to the world that Jesus could save a drug addict. It, up to that time, it was hopeless. Because at that time, in 1958, there was no heroin. Very little. Most of it was pot. Then in 19, after we were here about a year, all the, the drug addicts, all, all the gang leaders I was working with, I was preaching to gangs first because there, wasn't, there were no drug addicts on the street. Just musicians smoking pot and a few things. 1958, 1960, heroin hit. And all these... Gang members that I was working with were on the streets. Now, they weren't fighting. They were just trying to get money to support their habit. And I noticed kids out in, in the cold of night, uh, you know, it was zero out, and they had no jackets on. They didn't feel the cold. And I was figuring out, man, these, these kids don't even feel the weather. I went up to one, so it's one. He said, I'm high, I'm high. He couldn't feel the weather. And, 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 and I began to suddenly see these kids vomiting and laying all over. And suddenly, I didn't know anything about drugs, but nobody, nobody believed then. Not even the church believed that a drug addict could be saved. Too cold to plow. God said, I'll save them. And folks, thousands and thousands have been saved now all over the world. Hallelujah. I'll tell you something else. These willing servants are not going to be afraid of the lion out there roaring. The scripture says the slothful or lazy Christian saith, there's a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. Proverbs 22, 13. Proverbs 26, 13. The slothful man says, there's a lion 
out there in the way. A lion is laying and waiting in the street. Devil's too powerful, they say. He's got the whole world in his hands. You know that song, he's got the whole world in his hand. They're talking about the devil. I don't believe, I believe God has the whole world in his hands. You know what the Lord said? Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city. Bring in hither the poor, the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. Bring them in. He said, don't be afraid of the lion. Uh, some of you remember uh, about two years ago, there, there was so much talk about crime in the subways and everything. I got to thinking, boy, one of these days it might affect our People won't come on Sunday nights and Tuesday nights. They only come Sunday morning because of the crime. And so on a Tuesday night or Friday night, I open up the microphone and I, I said, if the Lord's delivered you from, a, you know, somebody tried to attack you and everything, come up and tell us about it. And I'll tell you what, I, I heard one after another. We were here for about an hour, remember, hearing testimony after testimony of people who've been delivered one lady, she said, I carry my, I don't know if she's here tonight or not, I carry my Bible in the subway. Anybody come around to hit me, she said, I'll use this as my club. This is my club. <laughs> and I, I, had, I had sisters all over the church said, Brother Dave, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I was the only one afraid. <laughs> Nobody else. How many are not afraid of the lion out in the street? Come on now. I'm not afraid of the lion out in the street. He said, go out into the streets and lanes of the city. He didn't say, go out in the lanes of the, except New York City in 1995. Said, go out quickly in the streets and bring in the hither, the poor, the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. But you know, there's a growing number of Christians, and I'm going to preach about five more minutes. There's a, a number of Christians now that are he heading for the hills. They're hiding. In fact, I get letters now from people on my mail list that Brother Dave, and they say, I'm prophesying to you. I heard from the Lord. You have to get out of New York City quickly. You've got about six months left. It's going to be bombed. I've got others saying, Brother Wilkerson, God's telling everybody to flee to the hills, go to Montana, go to Wyoming, go somewhere and get a farm. There's a book just been written, and it's, it's by a Christian who's a member of the Coalition on Revival. And let me, let me read to you what he says Christians have to do now. They have to go out in the country and get at least five acres. You have to have $500 of silver U.S. dimes, a six-month supply of dehydrated food, a home water filter system, water storage facilities, chemical toilet, kerosene heater and lamps, survival stove, fire extinguisher, at least one forty-five Colt automatic pistol, this is, this is a, in fact, this man's a preacher who wrote the book. You've got to have a 30 6 rifle with a four-time scope, a 12-gauge shotgun with pump action. You, you must have ammunition of 500 rounds, 22 long-range ammunition, air rifle, reloading equipment, high-quality first aid kit, battery-operated shortwave radio, citizens' band radio, 50 pounds, one can pounds of coffee for exchange. <laughs> 100 six ounce tins of cigarette tobacco so you can trade when the crash comes. 20 pounds of inexpensive pipe tobacco. One case of expensive whiskey, preferably Jack Daniels or wild turkey. That's what it says. Thirty Mexican gold coins, five U.S. twenty-dollar gold coins, and he says the booze and the tobacco is to bribe the law, the sheriff, in time of anarchy. You bribe people. Come on, this is a Christian. This is a, a preacher. He sent me the book, and I start reading through this. I said, I got to think. I can't find any of that in the Bible. I can't find any of that. My Bible says, go quickly out into the streets. Bring them in. Folks, you know where I want to be when the crash comes? Right here. With God's people. I'll tell you something. Let me tell you something. 
you're going to be safer here. Have you been reading the news about those people out in Montana? At a farm? With the FBI? They've got their guns, they've got their kerosene, they've got all that, they're in jail! And we're here winning souls. Let me close with this. Bible said, he that seeks to save his life shall lose it. He that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Hallelujah. You know, the Bible says they're going to cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them. While we are praising God, we're going to go out in a blaze of glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn around to these three people and say, God has everything under control. God has everything under control. Everything. Stand, please. He said, Brother Dave, if you believe hard times are coming, why aren't you storing food? I've been storing food. Right here. <laughs> Beloved, our security is not in guns, not in a stash of food. Our security is in our Lord. Hallelujah. Beloved, he's kept us to this time, hasn't he? No matter what happens, he's going to keep his people. He's going to keep you. He's going to keep me. Hallelujah. Folks, what I'm trying to say tonight, and the last thing we'll say to you, the Lord wants you to come to church with hope. He wants you to have hope about the salvation of your family. He wants you, when you walk the streets, to know that angels walk with you. He wants you to know that he wants you to be absolutely fearless. And he wants you to, to, to boldly tell everybody you can about Jesus and believe, believe that God's going to give you a harvest. That, that you know, many may reject it, but folks, you're going to find more and more people are open. People are hungry. They want to hear. And folks, you've got to believe what the scripture says in, in Psalm 1. I believe that with all my heart. To me, that's not theology. To me, that's not just something I read and forget. I believe that with all my heart. And that gives me hope for the young people, and not only in this church, but in this city. No matter how they curse, no matter how they drink. It may be, look, I, I've thought for a whole while we've lost the whole generation. And then I go to the word that says, no, he says he's going to have the dew of the youth. He's going to bring diamonds out of these kids. They're going to be diamonds that shine. Look at, look at Timothy. That's all these guys in the front rows here. These, these were guys that society and everybody else gave up on and for, for Sarah House here. And folks, we've changed the name from Hannah to Sarah. We had to because there's a whole bunch of other Hannah Houses all over the United States and people are mailing us. We're confused by it, so it's called Hannah House. But these girls that are up here in the front, they are diamonds. But people would have thought nothing could have been done. I'll, I'll tell you something else. Up there, down here, if God can save you, he can save anybody. If he saved you, he can save anybody. If he saved me, he can save anybody. Yes, hallelujah. God, give us hope. Give us faith. We are not a defeated people. We are a victorious people. God, God gave us uh, what I believe is the best theater in this city, right in the middle of Broadway. He's raised up a standard, and he is saving people left and right, people uh, from all walks of life, and he is moving by his spirit. God, help us to act and move, not in cowardice, not worried about a lion in the street or the coldness of conditions, but to trust him in all things. And Folks, we intend to keep plowing. God sent me here to sow... And, you can't sow till you plow. We've been plowing and plowing, and now we're sowing, and we're going to reap. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord.
we don't try to pack this altar or anything else. We're just here uh, to serve God's people and to reach those who are in need and the lost. But I feel that there's some balcony in the main floor. <clears throat> and here's what the Holy Spirit put in my heart just, just a moment ago. Some of you standing here have no joy. I don't know if you lost it or you just misplaced it. But the joy of the Lord is not there. You, you, you sat and you heard the message, but you sat with a burden hanging on you. Just hanging on you. Bring that burden to the Lord now. But please don't come unless you're going to believe with me that while I pray and we pray together, that's going to be lifted from you. Because the Bible said the joy of the Lord is your strength. And I don't want you to walk out of here weak. You that have come forward, if you can look this way for just a moment, please. I am so, uh, there, there's such a joy in my heart when I know how much he loves his children. The Lord loves his people. If you can only get this down, so you have to be totally convinced that God's not mad at you. If God were mad at you, he'd cut you off long ago. We'd all been cut off. Because we deserve it, but he's a God of love and mercy and compassion. Yes, he's a holy God. He's a just God. But that whole, that, that the wrath of God is against those who reject him. Those who reject his call, his plea, and his many, many mercies that he uh, extends to his people. But you're not that kind. You come here because you love him and you want him. And you, you want your heart given to him. Isn't that why you came? You want to give your whole heart to him? How many could say amen to that? I want to give my whole heart to the Lord. I want to hold nothing back. Now, if you have a besetting sin, often sin uh, brings condemnation, guilt, and it cuts off the joy. It's, it's hard to be in sin and have any joy. It's almost impossible. The only joy you can have if you're living in sin is a false peace and a false joy. So let the Holy Spirit... Bring that right out into the open and say, Lord, I know why I don't have joy because I'm still living in sin. And you're going to pray with me that God break the power of that sin through the Holy Ghost. The Holy God will put the Holy Ghost in you with such power that, that you don't have to struggle. The Lord will just powerfully encourage you and strengthen you so that you're not fighting it in your own strength, but in his power, his strength. And listen, if, if, if you're listening to the lies of the devil, the devil will lie to you and say that you're not going to make it. Uh, he will bring depression on you. Sometimes it's physical. Sometimes it's mental and, and, and spiritual. And many times then he will just come and harass you with lies. But I'll tell you, wait, you know how to deal with the lies of the devil? Just remind him of the truth of God's word. Remind him of the truth of God's word. The devil has to flee at the truth. He can't handle the truth. Hallelujah. You just say, my Bible says, my Bible says if I confess my sins, he's faithful just to forgive me and to cleanse me, to make me clean. And when you're clean, the devil has no rights. Now, I'm tell you, I want to tell you something. No matter how long you serve the Lord, no matter how you are in the Lord. He's always going to be an accuser of you. You're always going to have him accusing you. So just don't put up with it anymore. Say, devil, I've had enough of that. I'm not going to listen to you anymore. I'm going to believe what God's word says. I'm going to stand on the word of God. That's when joy comes, when you take your stand on the word, not on your feelings. If I lived by feelings, I'd never, hardly ever be able to survive. You can't live by your feelings. Amen. Pray with me now, right out loud. Jesus, I give you my heart with all of its sins and all of its weaknesses. And I come to you for help. Forgive me and deliver me from all the power of sin. Fill me with the Holy Ghost that I may have power and authority against the devil. Take all the fear out of my heart of the devil's power or the power of my flesh and help me to understand 
that he who lives in me is greater than all things else. All other things. Yes, all other things. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Lord Jesus, I want my joy back. Give it to me by faith. I believe you saved me. And I believe you can keep me. I come like a child in simple faith. I give you my heart, my confidence, and my love. All right, now I want you to just raise your hands and love Jesus right now. Just love him right now. Love him. Lord, I love you. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for caring about me. You'll never cut me off. You'll never cut me off, Jesus. You won't cut me off. Hallelujah. You won't cut me off. The Lord will not cut me off. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you will never cut me off. You'll strengthen me. You'll heal me. Deliver me. Glory. Hallelujah. Dear Jesus, I thank you so much for the power of God. Thank you for this service, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that abides. We thank you, Lord, that we can appropriate it this morning for this hour of need. Let the mighty power of the Holy Ghost touch every heart, every listener. Let no one leave this service this morning without being moved. Move us, Lord, until there is a reaction in all of our hearts, to the mighty word of the Lord, the quickening power of God. We know that you are here, you abide, and you're with us now. Every word that proceeds out of our mouth this morning shall bring glory to his matchless name. Amen. Power over sin. I have an unusual kind of respect for the word sin the same kind of respect I have for a rattlesnake coiled for an attack. For over eight years now, I've ministered the very gates of hell, and I've seen every variety of sin there is, and I've wept my way through human graveyards of depravity and hopelessness. My congregation has already been to hell and back. Those that I minister to walk only at night. And their only consolation is that there are so many others just like them. Sunshine to them is painful. Life is a dreaded ordeal. Pleasure is only another form of pain. Death is a desired haven, a way out of bondage and total demon possession. My parish, of course, is the gutter. The big people here are the drug addicts, the burglars, the muggers, the alcoholics, the gangs, the debs and dolls, and the con artists. None of them very old in years, but all of them old in misery and pain. This is a world where the little people are born old. Children are conceived in the hates and shames and sins of their parents. Their tender little bodies become their enemies, used only to feed them drugs, disease, and liquor. They cry when they're born without any hope of being heard by men. They are born wishing they were dead. They are born to sin-cursed parents who spend every nickel on fifths of whiskey instead of quarts of milk. They land in the street jungle because it's better there than in their home. Hell to them is home. Satan rules supreme in the world that we minister to, the other half. He entices the young and the innocent. He enslaves them with appetites and habits that break down their morals, their health, and their integrity, waste their energies, and dissipate their strength and power leaving them nothing but the pitiful wages of sin, death. Little well, skinny Carlos is a point in case, case in point. 17-year-old boy that I met in a basement, 110th Street in Harlem. He had never in his 17 years seen the Brooklyn Bridge, though he lived in Brooklyn, uh, in uh, Harlem. He'd never been down to see the Brooklyn Bridge. Never been out of a 20-some block area in all of his life. 
His mother had left him when he was 14 years of age, and he moved into a basement. He was allowed to stay in that basement by firing, stoking the furnace. And I went down to look at his little room. I was shocked, and I've seen plenty. He had an old urine stench mattress on, right on the dirty floor. There were no doors or windows in that basement, and the coal came rushing through there in the winter. Rats. He had a little calendar, three years old, hanging on the wall, a little picture of his mother and an old burnout candle. A few rags that he used for blankets. The boy ate only what he could steal. A bag of oranges, a loaf of bread. He had a little needle, a set of works underneath the little stone. He sat there day after day, shooting narcotics into his vein and living his little world. The boy hadn't bathed in months, and I don't suppose he'd changed his clothes in at least three months. I was so shocked, I forced him to come to the center. We made him take a shower, we cleaned him up, gave him good clothes. Talked to him about the Lord, but he was so stunned he couldn't uh, understand. When I went down to the office later, about one o'clock in the morning, to finish some work, I felt rather warm inside that I could provide clean sheets, a nice bed, good clothes, and comfort for a boy who'd been sleeping in a basement. Two o'clock in the morning, a blood-curdling stream, and Carlos ran streaming down our halls, and outside the door he hadn't even had his shirt on yet. He was naked from the waist up and carrying his shoes, ran streaming down the street and disappeared. The next day I went over to find him. I saw him in a little candy store. I said, Carlos, what's the matter? He said, Pastor, you took my only security. This is the only life I've known. He said, you took it away from me. I had to come back. I can't stand it anywhere else. Skinny Carlos died two months later of hepatitis in the Queen's Hospital. I haven't forgotten that boy because Satan stripped him and left him nothing. Daisy, young lady I talked about last night, a prostitute, a narcotic addict, 32 years of age, came to live with us at Teen Challenge Center, walked out against advice. Because of constant drilling in her veins, her surface veins collapse. When it happens, they shoot in the leg. And then when those surface veins collapse, they shoot in the jugular vein and in the breast. Daisy had walked out against advice, warned that I would bury her if she didn't obey the Holy Spirit. Daisy was prostituting two months later on a rooftop, 110th Street and Madison Avenue. And she got $2 for her trick, as we call it. A drug addict later found she had that $2, chased her back up on the roof and demanded the money. She wouldn't surrender to him, and he pushed her off the roof, and she fell on the pavement, cracked her skull, and died instantly. He went down and took the $2 from the corpse because Satan wouldn't even let her go into eternity with $2 in her purse. Fernandez was paid in full on the rooftop in the Bronx, and I told about this to the young people last night. Five teenage boys shooting narcotics, 16-year-old Fernandez died from an overdose. They tried to stick saltwater needles in his veins to shock him, beat him over the head with wet towels. He still passed away. The next day, they're walking the street trying to work an angle. They had no money for a deck of heroin. Remembered the corpse laying up on the rooftop, stretched up against the stairwell. They went up and stripped him of his clothes, stripped the corpse, took him to a pawn shop, and got $6 for his clothes and left him naked because Satan wouldn't let Fernandez go into eternity even with the clothes on his back. This is the world that we work in, a world of sexual deviation, overrun with homosexuals and lesbians, thousands of sad and lonely people who live normal lives most of the week, but suddenly at the weekend they're overwhelmed by a power from another world that sets them apart from all other creation. They are marked with a sin and a corrupted streak that drives them to depths of sin and filth that our decent minds cannot even comprehend. They are driven to alcoholism, to mental institutions, and so often to suicide. I received the most indecent mail of any minister in the world. My own mother has had to answer my personal mail because we cannot even trust anyone else to open the mails that come to me. From men and women all over the world who detail their obsessions and their deviant lives and life patterns.
These pitiful letters break hearts at our center. My mother has blushed many times. Tragic stories of bondage, demon possession, satanic attacks, obsessive habits, stories from laymen and ministers from many nations around the world who beg for our prayers and deliverance, prostitutes who wet their tears with their letters with their tears, homosexually bound ministers who threaten suicide unless they can be set free once and all from their sin, drug addicts who write jail epistles about the physical torture of cold turkey, who make sad and pitiful appeals for one last chance before they commit suicide. And friends, the sin cult that I'm talking about even now plagues the church of Jesus Christ. Our religious and secular campuses, colleges, Bible schools, and almost every Christian stronghold today, Satan has come down having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time. I've been lecturing in some of our Christian campuses around the country, and this year has been one of the worst disciplinary problems in the history of our schools. Our own school, Pentecostal, Methodist, and, and I, I can name some of the outstanding schools, Christian schools of our nation, for the first time in their history, are having problems that they can't even, can't even begin to control. Now, I've expected drinking, cursing, sexual promiscuousness, and deviation of every kind in the gutter where I preach, but now it appears that these same problems are causing many Christians to lose their first love. While the church has slept, the enemy has crept into soul tears. There is now winking at sin, no more concept of the exceeding sinfulness of sin. Now, I expect things to get much worse in the parish that I am called on to minister to. It will get worse and worse through time because God's word predicts it. Second Timothy 3.13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The government, with all of its millions and medical knowledge, will not stop drug addiction. I predict that thousands of more will become addicts each passing year. I was just telling the young people last night that one of our major problems in New York City right now are the numbers of teenagers are going through the high school corridors, unscrewing the little caps from the fire extinguishers and getting high on its chemicals. Licorice now they find is addicting, habit forming, and they're going to have to outlaw licorice. Because kids are discovering that if you take enough of it, you can get it high. More prostitutes will sell their body and soul. Skid rows will become overcrowded. Teen gangs will continue to terrorize and rumble from city to city. Civil disobedience is going to spread. Disrespect for law and order will be rampant. Thrill murders are going to increase. Sexual deviants will prowl more and more streets, raping and abusing more and more helpless women. Crime is going to go out of control completely. College campuses will not be peaceful and calm again. They will boil over with a new kind of liberalism, existentialism, extens, well, anyhow, existentialist, existentialist. I remember preaching at, uh, just pardon me a minute here. Where is it? Berkeley campus. Out on Sproul Hall during the Riots. They said they'll stone you. The communists and all their followers were over here screaming and hollering through the microphones. I stood up to speak and young people took their hats off. There were some 12 to 1,500 young people standing around with their hands folded. And I'd never seen anyone so respectful in all my life. And I wondered what it was and I turned around so happened the Teen Challenge Center there had brought along about five or six great big husky converted drug addicts who stood behind me with their hands on their shoulder. I would have listened too. I was in Buffalo, New York uh, for crusade and downtown in the city square I saw a group of kids, you know these shaggy kids who iron their hair and wrinkle their clothes. Marching around the city square, band of bomb. One sign read, Johnson's a liar. Get out of Vietnam. Right in the middle of a little kid had a for sale sign. 
And to me, that described what was happening to our young people today. Just anything to try to show some spirit of rebellion. This will increase. And mark it down. And you're going to hear it this morning from this pulpit. You mark it down well. If it doesn't happen this summer, it'll happen next summer. And I believe it will happen this summer. We're going to have the greatest revolution, the most vile, violent race revolution the world has ever witnessed. It will start this time in Washington, Baltimore, Detroit, Oakland. These are the cities that are going to get hit the hardest, including New York. Los Angeles will have other outbreaks, perhaps not as serious, but this will spread throughout the United States, and we're going to see. It hasn't even begun, my friends, because this is the sword of the Lord in the land. God has allowed it. This is the doing of the Lord. When a nation sins grievously against me, the Lord said, I will move against it with the sword of my hand. Bishop Pike and Bishop Robinson Incorporated and all these pipsqueak bishops will lead their herd of agnostic ministers deeper and deeper into the pits of confusion, sin and rantings and ravings against the cherished truths of the Orthodox Church. Liberals will be making pilgrimages to Rome to bend their knee to the power of the Pope. Backslidden Pentecostals and evangelicals will busy, be busy working more and more angles, getting involved in more and more red tape, trying more and more orthodox procedures that have already proven unworkable, send out more and more slogans, dream up more and more paper evangelism, and stray further and further away from the simple, uncomplicated dreams of the fathers who founded their movements. God's Word predicts it. Movies will get dirtier and more descriptive, TV shows will compete for vileness and freedom to satisfy the sex-satiated generation of the United States. Newsstands will brazenly peddle smut written by demons and devils. Divorce laws will be eased and the home life as we have known it will be ridiculed until it becomes acceptable to maintain mistresses and to indulge in extramarital relationships. It will become almost normal for college students to maintain sexual affairs while in school to keep up with the crowd. Moral standards are decaying, and now dishonesty, cheating, lying, and stealing has become a way of life. And God's word predicts it'll get worse. More and more of our church kids will get pregnant. Others will lose the fire and backslide. Others will live phony lives and hide behind double standards. But in the midst of it, persecution will get hotter and hotter. Become more and more difficult to live a really overcoming life. Intellectuals will scoff and cry, come on over and set yourself free from your Puritan attachments and background. Intelligent Christian youth will seek to become relevant rather than repentant. They will become involved, but instead become entangled. God's word predicts it. All I hear today is about a church that needs to be relevant. God's word said it needs to be repentant. We talk about being involved and instead we get entangled. I have never yet once seen a preacher who heads a civil rights demonstration stop the crowd and preach the gospel. And, and I just don't care what they think of me. Pastor, if you're going to march in a civil rights demonstration, stop the crowd. Go ahead and march, but preach Jesus first. Then march. Never have we needed, and I have painted this picture, and I believe it's true. I have not overstated it. And all you have to do, if you think I've overstated, is to take a little tour with me through our major cities and see that I have understated it, if anything. But we have never so desperately needed a definition of power over sin as we need it now. In the past few months, I have literally been driven to my Bible for a definition of power over sin. I have to have answers. The people that I work with have to have an immediate answer. They have to have help and deliverance right now. Never have people fought such great inner battles as they fight today. The question I'm asked most in the gutter, in crusades, must I give in to this thing that has me in its grip? Is there no power over sin in my life? Do I have to go through the rest of my life as a cripple? obeying the impulses of my lower nature. My husband sat in my office with his face in his hands crying a few weeks ago, 
a lovely wife and two beautiful children. He'd been converted for five years. He'd been seeking after God. But suddenly he turned to alcoholism. In fact, the night he reverted to alcoholism, he burned the bar down and hit the headlines. Came into my office. I said, why did you do it? Five years you were clean. He bowed his head and he wept. He said, Brother Dave, five years ago I had a secret sin. He named it. It's homosexuality. He said, I tried to overcome it. It lay dormant. Suddenly it overpowered me and I was so depressed. I went out and got drunk and I burned a bar down, told me the whole story. He looked up at me with tears streaming down his cheeks and he said, Brother Dave, is there no victory? Is there no power over this thing? Do I have to be a slave the rest of my life? He said, if that's true, I want to end it all now. A much used evangelist from Denmark came to my office, greatly used of God, reaching thousands of souls. He said, David, 10 years ago, I was an alcoholic, and I had the same problem that I mentioned to you just now. He said, God delivered me, filled me with the Holy Spirit, and I have won thousands of souls. He said, for 10 years, I've moved in God. He sat there trembling. He said, three weeks ago, strange spirit came over me, and I found the old desire it overwhelmed me, and I stood in the pulpit, and suddenly that craving, that desire hit me so hard. He said, I've come all the way from Denmark. I've read your book. You're the only man I think could help me, he said, Brother Dave. And he stood, though I've preached, and though I've known all about the movings of the Holy Spirit, he said, I have no power over this. I'm driven like an animal, and unless I can get victory, I've got to quit preaching. And if I have to do that, suicide is next. And I get letters from all over the world. I watch drug addicts as they leave us and revert to their old life. And I see them on the street. They cry and read their Bibles half the night. They say, I can't help it. I'm on a toboggan slide. I'm going down and I can't stop it. You know, we have thousands of Christians around the world who fight a battle constantly. They have never had a definition of power over sin in their lives. They're buffeted and they're tossed by every little wind and wave of temptation. Told of burying Danny last night. Danny walked out, shot through the heart by a police officer. We buried him three weeks ago. I remember talking to Danny on the street before he was murdered. He said, Brother Dave, how can I get power over this craving for drugs? Why didn't God set me free when I got on my knees and prayed? Why didn't God take the desire away? He said, it's still there and I can't help it. He said, I don't want it. I despise it. I hate it, but I can't stop it. Don't think for one moment that only drug addicts and homosexuals fight this horrible battle against sin in the soul. It's the battle of every great man of God. It's your battle and it's mine. I know what it is to pray for a crucified life. And by the way, it's not scriptural to live a crucified life. Crucifixion is an act. You live the resurrected life. And I'm tired of people telling me they're living a crucified life. They've never even been able to say it is finished. The act of crucifixion is finished when you can say with Christ at the cross, it is finished, and then give up the ghost. I do not live the crucified life. I live the resurrected life and the same quickening power that raised Jesus from the dead is in me. Hallelujah. And I live the resurrected life. Why don't you join me? I can give you the day. I can give you the day. I screamed in my little prophet's chamber, it is finished. And I've been preaching a sermon ever since God's not given anymore. He gave it all to Calvary. How can God give you something again he already gave you? He gave you... You, you know, friends, that there are not a handful of people in America that understand everything we need, we already have in Jesus. All the righteousness upon her. I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Hold it. But I spent eight long months, and I'm going to just stop a minute and tell you how it happened. Eight months ago, nine months ago, I was walking from one building to another. We've got five on the block. Six now. We just about finished the half million dollar center for the glory of God. Oriental man stopped me on the street. Give me, give me his name. 
He said, Brother Dave, God sent me to you. He said, your ministry is too shallow. First thing he said, he said, God sent me from behind the iron curtain to tell you this. He said, you need to take a year off and get into the word and understand the power of God. There's so many things that you haven't learned yet. You've got to get Dave Wilkson out of the way. And I got mad. I said, I'll tell you what you need, friend. I said, I'm the soul winner. And you come around here telling me, I said, that center's full of converts and God's moving, God's blessing my life. I'm preaching to six and 7,000 a week now. And you telling me that I don't understand it. I said, I'll bet you just go around telling the preachers things like I said, you need to get in the chapel and get on your knees and humble yourself. He just smiled. He was a little hurt. He walked away. I was mortified because the truth always hurts. Went to the office and the telephone rang. Some minister, didn't, I don't even remember his name. He said, it's not important. He said, for three weeks, I've sat at my phone. I've been fighting against it, but I just have to do it. He said, I had a vision of you, Reverend Wilkson. He said, I don't know much about you, but God told me to call you, and I've got to obey it. He said, you were standing before thousands of young people, one of your crusades, and they all walked out on you. And you went to the edge of the pulpit, and you fell over dead, and you fell in a hole. And I went and looked in the hole, and everybody said, Dave Wilkson is dead, and he was in his old clothes. He said, now, I don't know what that means. And I tell you, I just about had it. I, I yelled at him. I said, I'll bet you're a homosexual or something, and you've just taken a vicarious throw out of humbling me. I said, get off this phone and leave me alone. Hmm. I went home, this double barrel attack hanging heavy over me, and I went to prayer. And God began to break through and said, I sent them both. I sent them both. Cancel all your crusades. Cancel everything. And stay in this room until you begin to understand the kingdom of God within you. Until you begin to see the power there is in Jesus Christ. Until you dip, lengthen your cords and go deeper in the Lord. And it was in this process Eight months I tried, prayed, Lord, show me the crucified life. I've got to have a power of definition over sin, and I prayed, and I strove, and I fasted. I studied the lives of the great missionaries who spread the gospel around the world, and I found that they were fighting the same battle that I was fighting, that God never used one of them until they suddenly had a revelation of the power over sin that a man can obtain, that a man can live in complete victory in his life not subject to these things. I studied the life of Hudson Taylor. Hudson Taylor had been used of God to send some 200 missionaries to China, raised up China Inland Mission, one of the greatest missionaries in the world. In the midst of this, when God was using him, Hudson Taylor cried out. Suddenly I felt the ingratitude, the danger, the sin of not living nearer to God. He said, I prayed, I agonized, I fasted, I strove, I made resolutions, I read the word more diligently, I sought more time for meditation, but all without avail. Every day, almost every hour, the consciousness of my inner sin oppressed me. Now, this is a great missionary talking, was known around the world. I knew that if I could only abide in Christ, all would be well, but I could not. I would begin the day with prayer, determined never to take my eyes off Jesus throughout the day. But he said, at the end of the day, my catalog of sin would increase. My position became continually more and more responsible. My needs greater for special grace. And I continually mourned that I followed Jesus at such a far distance, and I learned so slowly to imitate him. He said, I can't begin to tell you how buffeted I am by temptations. I never knew how bad a heart I had. Who's talking? One of the world's greatest missionaries who suddenly saw revelation of himself and his weakness and his frailty. I never knew how wicked, how bad a heart I had. I knew that I loved God and I loved his work and I desired to serve him in all things. And I value and precious his lovely name. But often I'm tempted to think that one so full of sin as I cannot even be a child of God at all. He said, please. Friends, pray that the Lord will keep me from my sin, will sanctify me wholly, and will use me largely in his service. 
I listen to the to the pitiful heart cry of this missionary and other missionaries, and I realize that they fought the same battle. Others who say, I've walked with God for so long, I'm too intelligent to have to face such immature kinds of temptation. I should have passed this plane long ago. You can walk with God for 25 years and suddenly be cast down into a kind of temptation and face a battle in your life that you thought you would never be called upon to fight. You thought you were too far along the road. Have you fully persuaded yourself that you want to sell out to God, that you want to resist all the pressures of this age. You want to become a true overcomer, yet in spite of your resolutions, your determined will, your keen desire, your praying, your fasting, your seeking, you still must honestly admit that sin often overwhelms you. Things that you despise, you end up doing. You feel almost like it is an inevitable force that pushes you into moves and actions and indulgences of the mind and the body. Things that you hate. And then you wind up perplexed, your soul in turmoil, and you end up with an indescribable wretchedness and despair. Paul the Apostle knew something about this kind of wretchedness. Romans, what I hate, that do I. I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Paul was seeking a definition of power over sin. Say what you will, I believe Paul faced the same battle that you and I face. He said, for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. Paul was a wretched man until God gave him the same spirit of revelation of power over sin in his life. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, I don't want to get into a deep theological discussion about the two natures and about the deep meanings to be found here. Suffice to say that I believe Paul the Apostle is speaking for himself about his own personal battle and his own quest for deliverance and power over sin. And from backsliders and from saints of all ages, from David Wilkerson, from Hudson Taylor, from the lips of every dying prophet of God, from Paul the Apostle included, this cry has gone out through every generation. Where is my power over sin? I have seen my sin and my bondage. Who shall deliver me from my wretchedness? Who will set me free from the body of this death? Now, my friend, if you have not yet fought this battle, you are still an immature Christian. This is a battle of prophets. This is a battle of those who seek the deeper things of God. This is the battle of those who want to go all the way with the Lord. And if you've been walking with God, this message already comes very, very close to describing the very battle you fight right now. I thank God that there is deliverance. Man does not have to be a slave to sin. You do not have to live your life in bondage to the habits of a sinful urge. There is a way out. There is deliverance. There is power over all sin. Not enough for me to tell you that all power over sin is in Christ Jesus. No definition of this power will work in your life and mine until we learn how to get this power out of him into us. Listen to what Hudson Taylor said. He said, all the time I felt assured that there was in Jesus Christ all I needed. All power over sin, all victory in him was the richness and fatness of heaven. But the practical question was this. How to get it out of him. He was truly rich, but I was poor. He was strong, but I was weak. I knew full well that there was in the root, the stem, all the abundant fatness. But how to get it into my puny little branch was the question. Yes, my friend, Jesus Christ has all the power over sin. And I want you to know something else. Guidance, divine guidance is a person. It is Jesus. Guidance is a person. Victory over sin is a person. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But how do we tap that power for our own lives? When a man faces a battle and he wants a definition over sin, what does he do? Does he pray more, fast more often, make resolutions, try to be better? 
So we try to work up feelings of righteousness and seek something of an outward holiness. Hudson Taylor did. He said, I prayed, I fasted, I strove, I made resolutions. I read the Bible more diligently, but with all, all without avail. Every day, almost hour, every hour, the consciousness of sin oppressed me. I knew that if I could just abide in Christ, all would be well, but I could not find out how. My friends, absolute power over all sin belongs only to Jesus Christ, our Lord. It is he who has come to destroy the works of the devil. All our power over sin depends entirely on our faith in his promise to live his life through us. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. He didn't say, I'm being crucified every day. I don't believe Paul died daily. I believe he died a thousand times a day. What he's trying to say, just get Paul and Paul's out of the way so Jesus can live his resurrected life through me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith, not of Paul the apostle. Paul didn't have any faith, didn't even try to find it. Paul never looked for faith. He never tried to strive for it. He said, the light that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. You know, they doesn't have an ounce of faith. I haven't even been looking for it. I've never been trying to find faith because I've been letting Jesus exercise his faith through me. He knows the Father better than I. By the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul the Apostle found that his power over sin came by a full and complete faith that the life he lived in the flesh was actually Jesus Christ living through him and fighting off the enemy. This is what Hudson Taylor found. This is what I found. But how to get my faith strengthened? Not by striving after faith, but by resting on the faithful one. Hudson Taylor went outside and looked at a tree. He saw the branch and he tried to figure out how that branch got the life out. He said the branch didn't move, never did it think. It just stayed on the branch, the very fact that it was in. The vine just rested. There remaineth yet a rest of the children of God. He said, I will never leave thee. There is your rest. You can strive in vain to rest in him. You don't have to strive to rest, for he's not promised to leave you or forsake you, so you accept that and appropriate it by faith. Now hear me before I close. The most damning sin of all is unbelief. We make God a liar when we will not take him at his word. We lack power over sin because we toy with our unbelief. He has promised to quicken us in the moment of temptation, make a way of escape, and I've found what that way of escape is. When you really believe God's word, when you see the mighty power of Jesus Christ within you, when the moment of temptation comes, the way of escape is a quickening spirit sent by God through the Holy Spirit that will last as long as your temptation so that you can bear it. And every time I see it coming and you can sense it, the enemy comes in. We're not ignorant of his devices. He begins to plague us. And suddenly I start perceiving Christ. And I believe the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a power of perception. Paul kept saying, oh, that you might know, that your eyes may be open, that you may perceive. And this is a power of perception that Christ is here in the same spirit that raised him from the dead. And I picture that the corpse laying there in the tomb, the mighty spirit of God coming down into that tomb, picking up that body, that corpse, breathing life. And I see him rise new dimension, walking out of that tomb. And I try to picture all that happened in that tomb. And I picture the same spirit that raised him from the dead, suddenly in my moment of temptation, coming and picking me right up, right up. And suddenly in a new dimension, Satan cannot touch me. Satan cometh and hath nothing in me. Now that doesn't make me a bit better. I don't even try to be a bit better. And I don't fight anymore. I rest in his power, allowing Jesus Christ to live through us. And oh, how ignorant we are of this mighty power within us. Everybody talks about some storehouse somewhere. I've heard preachers say, oh, if I could only tap that storehouse. Here it is. It is within us. 
You don't have to reach out. God hath been pleased that in him should dwell all the fullness of the Godhead. When I stop to think of all the power he has given us, all power over sin belongs to him. You do not fight this battle anymore, my friends. Resign and commit it to the Lord and allow Jesus to quicken you. The same spirit that was in Christ shall be in you. The same spirit that raised him from the dead. You cannot say what will be will be. You cannot indulge in unbelief and expect to get victory in your life. You've got to stand up and declare to be to your own soul. Christ has power over this sin. Christ lives in me. Christ in me will deliver me. Christ in me will set me free. I can't fight it. It's too big for me. But Jesus has the power, so I'll rest in him. I found a simple but sure solution with this. I close my life for power over sin. I've discovered the secret of personal of power over personal sin in my life. You hear it well. It's this simple. Stay close to Jesus. Love him. Trust him. Believe in him. Commune with him. Draw nigh to him and he'll draw nigh to you. The answer to all power over sin is to become possessed with Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I'm a Jesus-possessed man. Possessed. Hmm. Who are these that keep backsliding? Who are these who grow cold and indifferent? Who are these that revert to narcotics and their sinful ways? Who are these who, like dogs, return to their vomit to wallow? Who are these that moan and groan that they can't help themselves, that they're being forced to sin? They are those who have lost their first love. They are those who walk afar off, those who dabble in the world and who pray only in a crisis. They are not lovers of Jesus. I tell you that lovers of Jesus have found there's victory over all sin. Lovers of Jesus. Learn just three promises. If a man will take just three promises, any three promises in the book, and stand on it and believe it, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And rest on his word. Exercise the power of Jesus within us. You too will find your definition of power over sin. I was told last night with this, I close. Anymore, when a drug addict comes to me and he says he has no more power. When I walk the streets, whether it be a prostitute, a drug addict, alcoholic, we round them up from the Bowery and God sets them free. I lay hands on them. It's though Dave Wilson steps right out of his body and stands beside and watches the Holy Spirit minister to Christ. I just yield my lips and pray that Christ will cause that living water. You know, the Bible said, greater works than these shall you do. Who does the greater works? It's Christ himself who's come back. He's still doing the works. Only he's doing greater works now than he did then because he comes back using our bodies. He has come back. All he wants is a body. And I pray and God sets them free. And then I step back into the body and rejoice and praise him for what he did through a yielded body. And God wants you to step aside in the moment of temptation. He wants you to step out of the body. He wants you to stand aside and see his glory. And then step back in when the victory comes and rejoice in his mighty delivering power. Heavenly Father, we thank you. There is all power over sin. Glory to God. The devil is a defeated foe. He cannot touch a child of God. Lord, give us that definition of power over sin this morning.